Hello, and welcome to Food for You and the Planet, a fresh new podcast that explores healthy and environmentally sustainable food solutions. This podcast is brought to you by Healthy Plan Eat Online Farmers Market. I'm Dr. Rosemary Ostfeld, and I'm your host. Together, we'll hear from leaders in environmental science, agriculture, medicine, nutrition, entrepreneurship, and more. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to hear all the latest in healthy and sustainable food with Food for You and the Planet. Today's episode features Jason Haas, co-owner of Tablas Creek Vineyard in Paso Robles, California. Jason Haas is the second generation proprietor of Tablas Creek. He learned the wine business at an early age, accompanying his father, Robert Haas, on European wine buying trips and spending two summers working at a winery in France. Thank you for being here today, Jason. My pleasure. Thank you. Great. So let's start off. Um, could you tell me a little bit about Tablas Creek Vineyard? Sure. So we are one of the pioneers of the California Rhone movement, which basically means the the, the group of wineries that are dedicated to working with the grapes that are traditional to France's Rhone Valley. Um, we're in Paso Robles. We've been here for 35 years. Um, so we're also one of the one of the pioneers of, of Paso, which if your listeners don't know, is it's a pretty dynamic and fast growing region. There's about 275 wineries here now. It's the third largest um, concentration of wineries after Napa and Sonoma in California. Um, and um, we've been we've been doing what we've been doing for for a long time. We're we're co-founded by a family of French winemakers, um, the Perrin family of Chateau de Beaucastel from Chateau Neuf du Pape, um, and by my family. My dad uh, was a wine importer, and this is one of the families of, uh, of of winemakers whose wine he was importing all the way back into the 1960s. And he and the two brothers who run the estate since the 70s became good friends and became convinced that California was a place where these varieties should really thrive. Um, and in 85, put together a partnership to, to look for a spot to do it. And in 89, bought this, this piece of land, a former alfalfa, fa alfalfa farm and cattle ranch here in the hills west of Paso Robles. Um, we imported cuttings of all of the principal varieties from, from Bocastel, from, that, from their estate, because there were several grapes that had never been used in California before that we knew we wanted. Um, and uh, and set up. So we're, we're both in a state winery where we've got 270 acres of property, not all of it planted, only about 125 of those acres are planted. Um, and then we also work with about, I don't know, 10 or 12 vineyards each year to buy some grapes as well. We've tried to really push on the farming side of what we do. We're, we've been organic since our inception. We've been biodynamic starting in 2010 and fully biodynamic since 2016. And then in 2020, we became the first winery in the world to get the new regenerative organic certification. So try to try to think about the implications of what we do. Um, it obviously goes beyond just the wine that we make and, and do things the right way. So what was your life like uh, bec before becoming involved with Tablas Creek? Well, I didn't want to go into a family business straight out of school. So I, I actually... I have a have a master's degree in archaeology. Um, I worked as a teacher for a while. I got recruited out of that to join a tech company in 1998, kind of at the height of the tech bubble, a company that taught web programming languages. So I did that for four years. Um, worked as a consultant for a little while, built websites. Um, and then in 2002, kind of rejoined the family business at the point at which it had grown from being a project into being a business that needed somebody to, to run it. So I started out um, kind of focused on the marketing out here. That turned out to be the biggest challenge that we had in the, in the early years. Uh, but I don't think I would have been able to come out here and, and have confidence in my own decisions and, and just kind of the life experience that I would have wanted if I'd come straight out of school. So I, I moved out here in 02 when I was 29. So Tablas Creek was the first vineyard to become regenerative organic certified. So what made you decide to um, achieve certification? So there's there's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, there's sort of two piece, two ways I would answer it. First, in general, we believe in certifications. So there are, it, it's pretty common in the world of wine to have people say, oh yeah, we, 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 
we farm organically, but we, we don't want to certify. It's too much paperwork or it's too expensive or, or maybe it'll tie our hands. Um, and in my experience, when you really look under the hood at places that places that are like that, they're, they're hedging. They're, they want to be able, if they get to something that they can't deal with organically, to be able to intervene um, chemically. And that's a slippery slope. Um, and it's really useful, I think, having an external auditor coming every year and knowing that you'll be audited. Um, and I think it also helps build a community of kind of like-minded folks that you become a part of. As for why the regenerative organic, um, it, it essentially filled in all of the gaps that we saw in the other certifications that we were a part of. Again, I, I mentioned that we've been organic and biodynamic. Um, organics is great, but limited. It's basically a list of things you can't use. Um, so as long as you aren't using chemical herbicides, pesticides, or fertilizers, and you go through the certification process, you can be organic. Um, but it doesn't say a lot about how you're using resources. And in fact, a lot of organic farms are very resource intensive, water intensive. They're still, still putting in a lot of inputs from the outside, a lot of organic fertilizer. You're basically replacing chemical inputs with non-chemical inputs. Biodynamics is an improvement on that in that it's sort of a holistic look at how you farm, how you create a full ecosystem within your farm that means you don't have to intervene chemically or, or otherwise. But it was written 150 years ago by an Austrian philosopher who didn't have much hands-on farming experience. And it talks a lot about things like activating cosmic energies. And it, it's just sort of hopelessly unscientific. And it's it doesn't focus on things that weren't an issue 150 years ago, like resource scarcity and climate change and, and things that we know are like clear and present issues. So, and, and then there are sustainability certifications and there's like 20 of these in California that look at a wide range of the things that you do as a business um, from your land use to your resource use, to your farming, to your, fostering of biodiversity to your use of water to all kinds of stuff. But all of the certification, all the sustainability certifications, they suffer from the same issue that they want people inside their program because they believe in this process of continual improvement. And so the bar that they set to get in is I think unacceptably low. Like there was a big announcement that one of the, one of the major probably the most influential sustainability certification in California, which is called Napa Green, they announced a few weeks ago that they were going to phase out their permission for people to use glyphosate. Like, and this is the first one of these sustainability certifications to even go that far. And so I feel like if you are certified sustainable and you're spraying your vineyard with Roundup every year, like that's just not a high enough bar. So the, the thing that we really liked about regenerative organic is that like it, like even the base of it, even the bronze level is super rigorous. You've got to be certified organic to start. No hedging on that. You've got to be um, doing certain things. Well, actually, let me even like, let me go about this another, another way. So there's basically three pillars to regenerative organic. Um, one of them is soil health, which basically takes a lot of the stuff from biodynamics, but subtracts out the mysticism and adds in kind of the measurement and scientific basis, things like uh, fostering biodiversity, creating a really healthy microbiome in your soil, moving away from tillage, um, cover cropping, avoiding bare ground, like all, like all the right stuff. The second is um, animal welfare, so you've got to you've got to have an animal welfare certification if you have working animals on your farm. We've got a flock of two hundred and seventy five sheep that do a lot of our weeding and a lot of our fertilization, so they have to be treated well. And then the third is a farm worker fairness pillar where you have to make sure that all of the all of the farm workers um, who are involved in your operation are fundamentally they're trained on their rights as farm workers that they are they have good working conditions that you've set up systems where their feedback is solicited and encouraged and acted upon 
And then as you work your way up to the higher levels of certification by the, to get to the gold level certification, you have to be paying a living wage for your area plus 10% for every farm worker who walks onto your property, whether they're there for a day or whether they're there full time. So those three pillars give you the breadth of a lot of the, the best of the sustainability certifications, but also the depth and rigor that you have to have on organic certification. You have to be doing the, the soil health pieces. You can't, you can't fudge it. And so when, when we were approached, like after we wrapped our heads around what it was that this was all about, because we had never heard the term regenerative farming when they reached out to us in, in early 2019 and asked us to join the, the pilot program. But once we wrapped our heads around it, like it just it, it just clicked. Everything, all of the pieces of it made made so much sense to us and it, it seemed like the right way forward. So what was it like um, going through the regenerative organic certification process? Well, you have to remember that we were a part of the pilot program. So we were there with them as they were figuring it out. So it was it was a lot. I mean, it was basically four separate audits. Um, so we had to have that soil health audit. We had to have the, or whatever, the, the, the organic audit. Then we had to have the animal welfare audit, which was a separate company. Then we had to have the farm worker fairness audit, which was another separate company, which had never certified an operation of fewer than 500 workers before. And we're like, whatever, not even a 10th that size. So, um, and then there was the overall regenerative organic audit that talked about things like resource use and um, the things that are, are beyond the scope of what organics looks at. So it was a lot of back and forth. It was a lot of paperwork. Um, but the idea of, of the participants in this pilot program is that they wanted people who were basically doing all the stuff that they cared about already. And they wanted feedback on the process. So it was a lot of back and forth. It was a lot of talking to the to the executive team at the Regenerative Organic Alliance, basically telling them, okay, this was super straightforward in the world of wine, but this and this doesn't, it's not really applicable as you've written it to the world of wine. Have you thought of doing it this way? So there was a lot of back and forth. And that was the idea behind the pilot program is that this is not a wine specific certification. It was created largely through the energy and, and um, resources of Patagonia the, the clothing company, because they wanted to be able to certify that their supply chain was farming in a way that was consistent with their corporate values. Um, and so there are separate regenerative organic protocols for everything from cotton to row crops, to orchards, to livestock, to aquaculture, to wine. So um, they, they all have to satisfy these basic tenets, but they want to be able to be responsive and specific to the different crop types um, so it was very interactive. It was very, it was very, um, educational for us. I mean, we learned a ton about this and it was a super positive experience, but it was, it was also a lot of work. So what are some of the agricultural practices that you implement on your vineyard? There's a lot. Um, so, I mean, if you're talking specifically about the, like the regenerative, um, the regenerative pieces of this. Um, the Probably the core of this is our grazing program with our flock of sheep that essentially contributes all of the fertility that we need. We also do a big composting program, but I, I think most of the fertility comes from the sheep. You figure a flock of 275 sheep drops something like 750 pounds of manure a day. So we move them in a rotational grazing plan through the property so they don't stay anywhere for more than about 24 hours. Um, so we're building electric fences, um, keeping them enclosed in an area of an acre or two, and then moving them every 24 hours in this plan through the whole property so, so they don't neglect any areas and so that they don't overgraze any areas. And that allows us to reduce our tractor passes through because we don't need to mow. It, provides this incredible dose of fertility and also um, kind of microbial activity stuff that lives in the guts of the sheep um, and then gets kind of seeded into the vineyard every year. So that's a really huge piece. Um, another big piece is cover cropping. One of the one of the most important things about both biodynamic and regenerative farming is that like bare ground is is to be avoided if you possibly can. 
Um, and that's for two reasons. One, it's a missed opportunity. You really want photosynthesis going on because otherwise those that, that solar radiation is hitting your soil, drying it out, killing the microbial activity that's that's there instead of being captured by plants and photosynthesized and turned into carbohydrates. So I mean, plants are, are sort of our engines to help pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The roots that they grow in the soil both put carbon into the soil and um, help the with things like soil compaction and water retention and, and all sorts of stuff like that. So we've been we've cover cropped since the beginning. Um, we do a mix of things where we, we're letting things reseed natively and also then adding with these kind of puncture seeders that go through the mat of of uh, growth and roots from the year before. If we want to add certain things like we've been adding legumes to the mix, which are not native out here. So we're adding um, peas and fava beans and clovers. Um, we're also adding um, these daikon radishes, which act as these soil aerators and have these deep tap roots. And so we can, we can do that. Um, the compost program that we do is big. So um, we compost all of the skins and stems and seeds and stuff that are left over from our winemaking and also the vine um, clippings, the vine prunings that we take every year. So that we use in a couple of ways. We will spread compost out on the vineyard before we get our first rain of the, of the season, usually in November. We also brew batches of compost tea out of that and spray that on the vines. It helps um, discourage the growth of mildew and reduces the amount of sulfur we need to use to, to, to spray to keep things from, uh, basically to keep fungal diseases from being a, a problem. And then in the winter, and I posted about this recently on our social media, it's kind of cool, um, but we, we reorient our compost piles as we get to the rainy season so that in the low part of the vineyard, any extra water that we get drains through those compost piles. And then we dig a series of retention basins that slow the flow of that water off the property. And that essentially are this giant swimming pool sized compost tea brewers that we then um, pump and spray onto like anywhere within a couple hundred yards of those retention basins, which gets a ton of really useful microbial stuff out into the vineyard and out of these retention basins in between rainstorms. So um, that's a big piece of it. We've also been working, we've sort of changed the way that we've planted um, over the 35 years that we've been here so that we're planting with less density and moving towards dry farming. So uh, planting vineyard blocks that don't need irrigation because they may only be 500 vines per acre instead of 1800 vines per acre. And they've got more cubic yards of soil. Um, and we feel like that's obviously water availability is one of the big challenges that everybody in California deals with. So that's a, a way to address that. So uh, there's lots of other stuff that we do, but that's kind of the core, I think that most important piece is. What are some of the challenges of using regenerative organic practices? Um, I mean, I don't know that I would characterize it that way particularly um and i'm also not sure i mean given our own experience where we were already farming organically and biodynamically like if you think of that continuum from like modern chemical farming over here to regenerative organic here like we were already like here so like all of this stuff i'm sure if you talk to people who had who were used to chemical farming, they would say, oh, it was so much easier to just do this, but that's not, that's not us. Um, I mean, I would say that the biggest challenges are for us, at least as we made, made our change is we had to do more record keeping. So we were used to doing, we were used to doing things focusing on process. And that's, that's because both organic and biodynamic are essentially process-based certifications. If you do things in an organic way and you get certified, you're organic. You do things in a biodynamic way and you get certified, you're biodynamic. Whereas regenerative organics, you have to do things like measure the carbon content of your soil every year to show that the impacts of the things that you're doing are having the effect that you hoped. So we had to be, we, we were used to doing things like saying, oh, well, our cover crop looks really healthy. Therefore it must be working. 
Um, so we've had to be more systematic about measuring some stuff. The other thing that we realized we had to do, and, and this is, I think, really fascinating. Um, we, we had to change the way that we interact with our field crew. Um, and we've always taken a huge amount of pride in the way that we treat our farm workers. We, we made the commitment back in 1996 to give our core field crew of 10 year round employment. Um, and like, we have incredible like tenure and longevity and loyalty from that crew. I mean, we have four of the got four of the 10 guys that we hired in 1996 are still in our crew today, almost 30 years later. Um, but when we started setting up the things that were required by the by the farm worker pillar of the regenerative organics, including like weekly meetings with our our crew, where we were sort of breaking down some of the hierarchical um, just traditions, the way that it was done used to be like our vineyard manager would talk to or a viticulturist would talk to our vineyard manager, the vineyard manager would talk to the crew boss, the crew boss would tell all of the crew, this is what you do, and they would go and do it. And when they were done, they'd come back and then they'd get new directions. So um, the roundtable discussions that we that we set up every week back in 2019, um, where everyone like we really could sit around in a circle and everyone would go around and we talk about what we did the last week, people would offer suggestions. Like people who we weren't used to hearing from, like we were empowering to actually give feedback. And I mean, we learned really useful stuff. We got a bunch of suggestions in the way that you would expect, but there were also unexpected things like our tractors stopped breaking. And it's not that like people were breaking the tractors before, it was that they were worried that somehow if they reported, hey, that tractor sounds funny, like somehow they'd be blamed for it. Um, and just increasing the levels of trust that we had, we started hearing about problems when they were still in the fixable stage instead of the, I don't know what happened, the tractor's broken. Um, so that was really cool. And the other thing that we saw that was really cool is that these guys, in many cases, they've been here for decades, they started coming out on weekends with their families, showing them what we were doing and what they were doing, um, which like, that's it's not just sort of heartwarming, but like you think of the, you think of the, just the pride in workmanship that that shows, like we know that that has impacts, um, impacts down the, down the line. So like, I don't know if those things are hard, but those things were noteworthy um, and kind of, kind of cool for us to see. Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of benefits. So yeah, what are some of the other benefits that you've seen from um, being regenerative, organic, certified, and just moving towards these more sustainable practices? I mean, I think the, the biggest benefit for us is that when you focus on soil health, which is really what this is doing. I mean, we think of ourselves as farming our soil as much as we do as farming our, our vines. But when you do that, you're creating soils that have more organic matter, more richness, more ability to retain water, more ability to withstand heat spikes. Um, I mean, the, the, there's this crazy statistic um, that we got from the Regenerative Organic Alliance that for every 1% increase in soil organic matter content, can retain 20,000 more gallons of water per acre um, because organic matter bonds with water and holds it in a way that mineral matter does not. Um, so just the fact that, I mean, it, this is a tough growing environment. The It rains here between November and April, and then it stops and it's totally dry during the summer. It can be 105 degrees in the day with 10% humidity for a month on end. Well, actually be unusual 105 for a month on end would be, would be pretty oppressive, but like we usually get 20 or 30, 100 plus days in the summer. It's not, that's not unusual. Um, and the, the ability that the vines have in with soils that are richer and healthier to withstand the impacts of these heat spikes and these droughts is I think for us, the single biggest positive impact. And we've noticed that, in the like the the kind of crazy weather years we've had recently 
I mean, you think that we had two very hot years in 2020 and 2022. We had the coldest year that we've had in more than a decade in 2023. We had pretty brutal drought that lasted between um, 2020 and 2022. And then we had record-breaking rainfall last year. And so through all of these different conditions, we've had a string of really high quality vintages. And I don't think that would have been possible if the vines had been sort of left out there to figure it out on their own. Um, well, that's not really a good way of putting it. Um, obviously, it's, it's awfully anthropomorphic of, uh, of me to say, but just the, the ability of healthy soils to regulate and moderate extreme weather events to absorb water when it comes and give it back to back to the the plants that need it when it doesn't come um is is i think the single biggest benefit that we see that's great yeah i think um you know a lot of people who are involved in um the wine business are concerned about climate change and how it may impact uh the way they are able to do their business around the world. Um, do you think that that is a real concern? And do you feel that um, moving towards these practices can help other vineyards? Yes and yes. Um, I think it is a real concern. Um, it's a concern to some degree everywhere, but a lot of the particularly Mediterranean climates that look like they're going to get both hotter and drier are, I think, at particular risk. Of, of the impacts of, of climate change. Um, and there's, obviously you can move to more drought tolerant rootstocks. You can move to different varieties that ripen later and, and are used to more heat, but there's a limit to that. And, and there are parts of Europe where the tradition is that there are certain grapes that can be grown in certain regions and you can't switch it. It's not like if it gets too warm to grow Pinot Noir in Burgundy, like they can just be like, okay, great. We'll switch to Syrah. Like, I mean, they're true. They, they, their rules say that they can only plant Pinot Noir. Like it, it's, uh, it's not so easy. Um, but the, the thing that we really love about regenerative organics is that it addresses both the, the causes and the effects of climate change. So causes, it addresses the causes in the sense that these sorts of practices are how you use your soils to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and, and have it act as a, as a carbon sink. Um, and I mean, there is a ton of topsoil, like so much topsoil around the world that you could go a long way towards reversing really all of the release of carbon dioxide since the beginning of the industrial revolution, if you were to build up the organic matter of your soils. And we've, we've been able to increase the organic matter percentage of our soils dramatically over recent years. And in fact, when we, when we sent in our first soil samples to the lab that the Regenerative Organic Alliance had licensed to do this testing, it's, a, it's actually associated with Cornell. Um, we sent the soil samples to Cornell and got a call from them saying, are these samples really from California? And we were a little offended. We were like, yeah, what do you want pictures? But they, they explained that like they were, the samples were testing between six and six and a half percent organic matter, which is what they would expect in a place like the upper Midwest or the mid Atlantic, someplace where it's wet and there's stuff that's decomposing all the time and soils are just kind of naturally rich. And that ag land in California usually tests between one and one and a half percent organic matter. So the fact that we've been able to add like four, four and a half percent organic matter to our soils through the practices that we've been doing, like that shows that this is the kind of, this is the kind of system that can have a, a real impact on that. And then in terms of the effects, what I mentioned before, where like this mitigates the impact of heat spikes, it mitigates the impact of extreme rainfall events, it mitigates the, the droughts that you know you're going to get. And, um, so you're sort of, you know, you're, you're, you're both attacking the root of the problem and you are adapting to the, the effects. So we've talked a lot about your growing practices, but are there any other special things that make, um, Tablas Creek wine unique? Oh boy. Um, so 
the way that we make wine um, is 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 pretty traditional. Um, so we'll pick things over the course of two months because not all these grapes get ripe at the same time. Everything gets fermented separately. We use all native yeasts, all native malolactic bacteria. So we're not adding anything um, in the fermentation process. So we feel like what we're doing really from the from the beginning of the growing season is trying to give the grapevines every possible chance to show off the character of this place in the wines that we make. So that's why we started farming organically back 30 years ago. It's why we moved towards dry farming. It's why the biodynamic and the regenerative organic we feel like um, are the right one of the reasons why we feel like they're they're the right thing to do not just for the the world but for the wines that we make and then we try to avoid kind of covering that expression up with our own winemaking fingerprints when um, when we get to the cellar so um if somebody if somebody tries tablas creek they should hopefully not be tasting new oak and uh whatever like winemakers choices they should be tasting the, the the grapes and the year and um the weather that that year brought and the 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 soils that they were grown in and, and all of that so we do both reds we actually we do reds and whites and rosés we do some wines that we we suggest that people drink young we have others that will age for 20 or 30 years if people want to lay them down um, and it's fun working with so many different, so many different grapes and so many different styles. We have 18 different grape varieties that are, that are in the ground here. We're the only vineyard outside of Chateauneuf du Pape that has all of the 14 Chateauneuf du Pape legal grape varieties. Um, and some of these are so rare that like, even in France, they're never found on their own. We planted, for example, one of the, one of our, our more obscure grapes is called Picardin, and we planted half an acre of it back in 2013 and increased the world's Picardin footprint by 40%. Uh, so it gives us the chance to play with, with grape varieties that we think are like potentially really cool, but in many cases became rare for reasons that have nothing to do with how good the wine is that they can make in a place like Paso Robles. Like Picardin, for example, was widely planted in the early early 19th century um, and then um, was pulled out because it was susceptible to powdery mildew, which they didn't have a solution for. So it was largely pulled out in the, the middle of the 19th century. And then when phylloxera, which is a great Paris, a North American parasite that um, spread through Europe and destroyed more than 90% of the vineyards in Europe in the late 19th century, when that rolled through and people had to replant, nobody replanted Picardin because like, why were you going to plant this other grape that was susceptible to this other problem that you couldn't solve? So like, we're lucky it didn't go extinct. Um, but it turns out that in a place like California, where mildew is not really a problem and we have tools to deal with it anyway, like it has this lovely brightness and minerality, great acids, good texture. Like, I think it's a super exciting grape. And we have the chance to play with things like that, um, that, that, that really nobody has in a very long time. That's awesome. Are there um, any other things that you'd like to share about um, your vineyard? Yeah, there are. Um, well, one thing that I think maybe people don't realize, even, even serious wine lovers and people who are focused on farming don't realize, is that if, if, if you care about something like carbon footprint, the biggest part of carbon footprint in the world of wine is not anything you're doing in the vineyard or in the winery. It's the packaging. Um, the glass bottle accounts for about half of the total carbon footprint of the, the world of wine. And so there are all sorts of incentives um, if you're trying to minimize your, your carbon footprint to rethink the, the bottle, rethink how you interact with the bottle. So we moved to a lightweight bottle about 15 years ago, um, which like you, you move from a regular bottle to a lightweight bottle, that's 10% off your carbon footprint, like right there. Um, but we've also been doing experiments with things like trying to sell as a high percentage of the wine that we sell for restaurants and wine bars to pour by the glass as we can in reusable stainless steel kegs. So it's essentially 
a, a package that'll get reused, whatever, 50 or 100 times. Um, and there's no waste, there's no waste of wine, there's no packaging at all that, that, gets, that gets disposed of. We've also been in the last couple of years experimenting with moving some of the wines that we intend for people to drink right away from bottle into like box, like the three liter boxes that are notorious for being like the place where you stick cheap wine. Um, but the package is not at fault for there being cheap wine in it. It's the perception that people have that only cheap wine should go in the boxes. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we've been trying to break people out of that. We've had great success over the last few years releasing some of our early drinking wines in boxes. We did it for the first time in 2022. And like I was hoping we would sell out in a month and we sold out of our, our initial boxing in four hours. And I got to spend the next week responding to frustrated wine club members who were like, I wasn't sitting at my computer and it sold out. And so it was just evidence to me that if you can explain to people why they should take a, a second look at alternative packaging, um, they will. And that's an area that I think you're going to see a ton of innovation in the world of wine over, over the next decade or so. That's amazing because I think that's something that people don't even think about when they're purchasing most things. So it's really cool to hear that not only are you working on improving your practices on the land, but also how you get your wine to uh, the people who will love it. So yeah, this has been a really fun conversation. Thank you so much for joining today, Jason. It was really great to hear from you and learn all about Tablas Creek. Awesome. Thanks, Rosemary. And if people are interested in kind of diving deeper into stuff like this, um, we do, we've been writing a blog for the last 15 years that like we try to be as absolutely transparent and share the things that, not just the things that we're doing and excited about, but also the, the questions that we have and the things that we're struggling with. Um, and that's everywhere from farming to winemaking to the business side of things. Um, so if people want to want to do want to dive into that, um, that would be a great place for them to start. They can find it off of our off of our website, which is just tubblesscreek.com. We also share a lot on social media. So we're at Tubless Creek on all those channels. Perfect. I can put those um, in the links beneath the podcast too. Thank you. Great. Have a wonderful rest of the week. And uh, thanks again. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you.